Welcome everybody to cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, DeFi, and NFT supported by the Singapore FinTech Festival. My name is Francesca Tay. The cryptocurrency space has quickly matured against a backdrop of a global pandemic. Institutional adoption, we have wider acceptance, better fundamentals, scaling solutions, disruptive innovations, I could really go on forever, and an ingenious new use case that's gained traction with increasingly digital first population. The old narratives are being rewritten right now by new proof points as the sector changes and charges into hyper growth. Now this session, we'll take a closer look at three hot topics in the crypto world. We're talking about Bitcoin, decentralized finance, better known as DeFi, and non-fungible tokens, NFTs. The conversation will cover crypto's fundamentals against a macro backdrop, the burgeoning new paradigm of DeFi and its promises of recreating the banking and finance system from the ground up. Plus, you don't want to miss this, the good, the bad, the truth, and misconceptions about NFTs. So bring out those popcorns, guys, poppers, notebooks, anything you need. Get ready to ask questions because I'm just so absolutely pumped right now to be joined by a panel of experts, humbling for me to be calling them my friends, really. First up, we have Zach Burks, founder and CEO of Mintable, an NFT marketplace that's backed by billionaire shark investor, Mark Cuban. We also have on the panel, Bill Singh, head of financial products at Bybit, and also from only the best crypto derivatives exchange, self plug Bybit. We have Shane I, head of R&D, and my good friend, Ignis Terranis, head of communications here at Bybit, who famously really, within the context of Bybit, said that the best time to embrace Bitcoin was 12 years ago. The second best time is now. Speaking of Bitcoin, the price of Bitcoin is up over, I think, 50% this year, uh, thanks in part to rising interest from institutional investors and corporate buyers. Um, BTC price right now, hovering around 45,000 US dollars, 24 hour change, about 1% or so. Um, a little bit of a comeback, uh, flipping from gaining traction really from a very different picture from what we saw yesterday after Tesla boss, Elon Musk's mixed messaging on Twitter. We're seeing if Ether XRP prices also in the green, not a, not a bad start for this session really, but you know, after what we saw yesterday, um, probably we've heard, we've, we're seeing some skeptics probably out there, you know, dancing to the I told you so jingle, right? Many Bitcoin, uh, many people view Bitcoin really as a market bubble waiting to burst. I know over the weekend, I was like reading the news and seeing Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey uh, saying that cryptocurrencies have, quote, no intrinsic value, end quote, and that people who invest in them should be prepared to lose all their money. Um, on the flip side, we also have some exciting predictions about Bitcoins, most, you know, coming from the most legendary evangelists. We have Citibank's global bank, global head of market insights product, Thomas Fitzpatrick, who um, made headlines uh, for his Bitcoin prediction of about 318,000 US dollars by 2022. Uh, of course, we also have the Winklevoss twins, famous Bitcoin billionaires who said that the leading cryptocurrencies has the potential to reach, wait for it, a price of half a million dollars by 2030. So we're asking you today, Yvonne, I'm going to need your help here, bringing up the opening poll. What is, folks, your price prediction for Bitcoin prices at the end of Q2? Option A, below 40,000 US dollars. Option B, 40 to 50,000 US dollars. C, 50 to 60. And if you're super bullish to the moon, guys, above $60,000. Take the poll. You'll see the answers very, very soon. We're talking about instant generation. Everything's got to be quick. I'm going to do a little bit of countdown. Let's just say 10 more seconds to go till we close the poll. Um, take the poll, let us know what you think about the price prediction for Bitcoin 
by the end of Q2, and we will close the poll in five, four, three, two. Get ready for the great reveal results. One, let's go. Do we have the results? Ooh, 50 to 60,000 US dollars. That's the majority, about 31% of you. Pretty bullish, we're okay. Um, at least that's a little bit higher from uh, what we're seeing in terms of prices right now. Um, but yeah, not, not bad. Um, so judges, panel, guest speakers, uh, the audience have spoken. It's, it's, it's a pretty mixed picture we're seeing out there. Um, so it's only fair that you guys kind of share your price predictions as well. Ignis, I'm going to circle back to you um, simply because of that genius phrase you've coined. Um, you said, and folks, if you missed it the first time, you might want to write this down. The best time to embrace Bitcoin was 12 years ago. The second best time is now. With all this mixed messaging going on, we're hearing about Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies in general. Ignis, what is your view and what are the upsides we're talking about here? Oh, thanks, Francesca. Um, yeah, uh, well, I, I think uh, it, it's, it's no uh, secret that I'm uh, uh, a Bitcoin bull and I have uh, a lot of uh, uh, high expectations, great expectations about how the orange coin is going to perform. I think uh, everyone knows the narrative, you know, the, uh, the Fed, along with almost every central bank in the world is uh, um, printing money like crazy. And uh, we are looking at uh, uh, Bitcoin as this uh, uh, manufactured uh, scarcity where people can find uh, a safe haven asset. Um, I think kind of like at the moment we can also see uh, because the, the market capitalization, even though it's already kind of like it's already inched past one trillion before, uh, when you compare it to the largest cap of uh, asset types, it's still relatively small. So, you know, a tweet from the techno king can still uh, tumble the market by, uh, you know, double digit. Um, I think it's really just kind of like um, everyone may be uh, a, a little bit kind of like impatient with uh, Bitcoin, considering it's still just, uh, uh, you know, a toddler, a little older than toddler, 12 years. Uh, in, in the space of 12 years, it's already uh, grown larger than some of the largest um, companies in the world. Um, it's already uh, closing to the market capitalization of silver that has been with us for the entirety of our civilization and uh, really bankrolled much of our building and, and really uh, commerce. So uh, in the long term, I, I'm very, very bullish about how Bitcoin is going to perform. Uh, but coming back to the question now, uh, at the end of Q2, I think I will go for the highest option here. It's just, uh, uh, you know, it, it behooves for me, uh, you know, after, you know, seeing the price of Bitcoin to kind of like have the most optimistic uh, uh, prediction. Uh, you know, either from kind of Bitcoin, just like, I think we are really just like one good news away from another um, uh, surge anyway. You know, uh, if it's small enough for uh, Tesla to tumble, uh, for, for Techno King to tumble for 10%, if we hear a news about uh, uh, an American uh, ETF uh, really coming into shape, we can see a uh, double digit bump in one day also. Bill, weigh in here. Do you agree? What's your price prediction uh, for Bitcoin? Well, I actually select the, the, the third option. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm actually a little bit conservative here. Uh, you know, um, I agree with uh, Ignis, like in the long term, we are all very, you know, super bullish on, on this uh, digital gold narrative. Um, but at this moment, you know, with all these uh, micro uh, environments, like but or we're talking about like a selling in the May or selling in the June, uh, you know, summer is always like very volatile for the markets in general. Um, also with all the, you know, like this interest rate is gonna, you know, like increase all this expectation. I, I just feel like a 50K to 60K um, has already implied like a move of 10 to 30% for Bitcoin. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm just like a conservative guy on, on the price prediction. So I'm, go, I'm gonna just go with the third option. Sounds good, I'm kind of with you here. Shane, how about you? Ooh, Shane, I think you gotta turn on your mic. Oops, Let's try that again. Nice, I hear you now. Okay. so. I'm pretty much in a conservative camp, so uh, pretty similar to Bill. 
right? But having said that, um, when you go past Q2, I'm a firm believer in market cycles. Uh, if you look at um, how Bitcoin has performed in the past, uh, past two halving cycles and look at the amount of institutional adoption that has occurred. And uh, I mean, frankly speaking, Bitcoin is the first uh, touch point, right? For many major institutions and uh, even retail investors when they enter the crypto space, right? So in terms of mindshare is extremely strong, you know, going forward towards the end of the year, uh, you know, honestly speaking, I wouldn't be surprised if we see a uh, market cap of the entire crypto space uh, uh, up to 10 trillion, right? So going forward uh, towards the end of the year, I'm extremely bullish. Uh, I don't think, like, just ignore the short-term noise and going forward, we're going to look at uh, probably a price target of closer to 100 to 200K. Yeah. Fair point. Zach, I'm going to put the spotlight on you right now because a little bird told me that you bought something called Bitcoin back in 2012. Is that right? A time when one Bitcoin, I think, cost just as much as, a, I don't know, like a cup of Starbucks latte or something. Um, tell me about your experience with Bitcoin and how you see the crypto asset where we stand right now. Has anything changed really in the past decade? Um, no, I wouldn't say anything's really changed in the past decade in terms of Bitcoin. Um, and, you know, the original question that you brought up uh, and where I voted at the poll, I think we're seeing a consolidation period for the next few, I don't know, maybe a month to a few months. Uh, and then ultimately by the end of this year, I think we'll be, I think we're going to end the market cycle around 120,000 for Bitcoin's price. Um, and that's just been my own personal kind of expectations um, for this bull run. And I don't, you know, I, I'm, I'm, hopefully I'm wrong and it goes, you know, 200, 250. Um, and hopefully I'm not wrong in the other way. And hopefully the, you know, the peak's not at around 75, but I would say, yeah, we're definitely, I think by the end of quarter two in the, uh, around the 60, 60,000 range. Sounds good. And I, I, I see a question coming in from the audience here, Nam Hung Tran. Um, question is, do you think BTC can be used as a long-term investment instrument or is it only good for trading short-term and taking profit quickly? Um, gentlemen, who would like to take this question? Uh, I think I'm going to take this question. Um, I think uh, in my view, like definitely like it's going to be like a long-term investment. Um, just, uh, you know, look, look at the chart of Bitcoin. Like all these uh, big moves, uh, they happen in very short period of time. Uh, if you are really like trading all this stuff, I mean, it's going to be very hard to, to capture all these big moves. Uh, if you are missing out like just um, the few best days across the year for Bitcoin, uh, you're not going to get a very good performance on, on, on investing Bitcoin, you know. So I, I definitely uh, think like for the normal people like who just want to into crypto and use that investment uh, rather than like trading it. You know, I think there's there's a lot of consideration also, um, Bill, and I think Shane, I want to bring you in here because um, a lot of people kind of see um, Bitcoin's role kind of um, as a store of value akin to gold. I think someone mentioned silver as well, um, but you know, because of scarce supply. But there's also that big question about whether or not it could dethrone cash, right? I mean, what's your view on Bitcoin and kind of its role in the whole financial system? Yeah, on whether it's not going to dethrone cash or not, my short answer is no, right? Um, I think the whole idea of Bitcoin being a payments network uh, kind of died in uh, after the 2017 bull run. Uh, if you try to do, uh, try to use Bitcoin as a payments transfer network today, you're going to find it's extremely inefficient, extremely slow and with high transaction costs, right? So that narrative has kind of died. Um, however, uh, this time around, with the heavy uh, monetary stimulus that we've seen uh, from the global central banks in response to the COVID crisis, um, clearly uh, Bitcoin has uh, taken its place as a kind of like store of value kind of asset, right? So as Francesca mentioned, um, a huge part of that is, you know, uh, it's an asset that you can compare to gold, right? But uh, if you really think about it, uh, I mean, you forget 
uh, the theoretical aspects of Bitcoin. For example, it's fixed supply, right? Think about what institutional investors want to use as a reserve asset, right? The number one most important thing to them is going to be liquidity, right? So you could buy physical gold bars or you could buy physical Bitcoin. It's going to be a huge difference in terms of how quickly you can uh, unwind your exposure if need be, right? So that's the first aspect. And then going forward, you know, Bitcoin's place in the crypto ecosystem and in the general uh, society at large, pretty much, uh, you can think of it as a first proof of concept of what a cryptocurrency can be, right? Because, I mean, if you think about it in the crypto space, Bitcoin's tech is actually pretty ancient, honestly speaking, right? Compared to a lot of the other stuff that we have out there today. However, um, in terms of mindshare, in terms of uh, what people understand about the space, the first thing they're going to think of is Bitcoin, right? So, um, I think more importantly, it's shown the world what's possible in terms of uh, blockchain technology, right? Every single crypto coin that exists today is directly or indirectly an extension of what Bitcoin has shown us. So, uh, so going forward, uh, you know, I, I think it will still be around. It can still be used as a reserve asset, you know, but uh, definitely um, there's going to be future improvements on the tech in the future in the form of other coins. Uh, or other uh, fintech solutions and so on and so forth. Yep. Mm-hmm. And I think, Shay, I think you bring up a good point about kind of Bitcoin, you know, being a poster boy of sorts, right? And kind of like, I think these days, especially you've seen that BTC dominance kind of like moving to the sidelines of sorts, um, you know, with various altcoins coming to play, um, you know, some people saying it's a healthy correction, this and that. Um, even, I mean, I, I see, I see many comments from the audience really talking about, oh, let's talk about Elon Musk, you know, his statements and uh, his, I have to slide this in, his bitter tweet moments, right? Uh, still very much a trending topic on Twitter, spilling into the markets, impacting sentiment and all that good stuff. Um, so with, I mean, we're, we're, we're talking about the whole crypto space in general, right? And also kind of like how, um, you know, influence Sirs uh, on Twitter, mixed messaging um, in the Twitter sphere. Uh, there's so much coming to play here, and I think in the bigger picture, um, what does uh, I'm going to bring in the whole Elon Musk uh, effect here? I guess what I guess what does this mean? Um, uh, the the whole uh, you know Elon effect and Twitter buzz. Um, affecting some, what does this mean in the whole bigger picture for Bitcoin and crypto in general? Um, are, are we looking at short-term effects, long-term effects? How do people make sense of all these um, noise? Ignis. Thanks, Francesca. Um, I think one thing sort of like Bill and, and Shane touched upon, but maybe didn't uh, uh, spell out exactly was like, if we really zoom out and look at the 10 year, 12 year kind of like uh, uh, trend lines to how Bitcoin is trending, I don't think there's any kind of like a debate as to uh, whether or not this is a, a, a surge in asset. Uh, it's only when we look at kind of much shorter time frames where people feel kind of unsure but like this kind of like pullback is not something that we have never seen. Every single um, uh, bull circle uh, have seen pullbacks like this. Um, and I think kind of like um, just conversations on Twitter then can, that can cause kind of real life uh, uh, um, trading behavior, market movement like that is in a way a, a positive sign as well. Cause like imagine like any other brand uh, having this kind of level of engagement um, you know, even Apple doesn't have this kind of engagement. Uh, nowhere, no, nothing comes near. And the Bitcoin as, as like an asset type, as a brand, it doesn't spend its own uh, market dollar. There's no kind of marketing budget. There's no kind of like paid employee uh, from the Bitcoin consortium. It's basically just, you know, people who are participants in the market. They feel passionate or, you know, maybe some of them are speculators, but it's basically like uh, people donating their time. I mean, maybe some of them have their agenda, but um, in a way, this level of engagement is something that you do not see in really anything else. And I, and I think that's a very positive thing that shows the strength. Um, perhaps just kind of like a, a one more lines. I think sort of like that, of course, everyone is here for the technology. Uh, I'm sure of that. I think another, uh, the, the, the largest uh, value that Bitcoin brings Aside from the technology, 
is just the uh, the network effect and how kind of like it has now its own gravity and it's attracting brilliant minds um, such as my uh, you know uh, delectable uh, fellow uh, panelists like brilliant minds attracted to this space and then it is through that we get innovations we get new use cases uh, you know maybe kind of like uh, trickling down to the rest of uh, uh, the, the ecosystem I think that the minds the collective minds that is uh, uh, created uh, in the Bitcoin space is uh, a huge strength that uh, um, other cryptocurrencies or maybe other brands do not enjoy mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really good point. And I think like, um, you know, when we zoom out um, over the horizon, we're seeing uh, like how the power of the blockchain and even DeFi in general, really like just like coming to play and, and kind of really propelling the entire financial system into, in, in, into a future that was can't even be imagined like just five years ago right and and you know even the craze in nfts and i'm looking at you here zach had led to a burst of activity on the ethereum platform ethereum of course the blockchain-based network that that backs most nfts so uh, al along those lines with that extension ether the digital token of the ethereum blockchain uh, just last week i think rose to an all-time high um 4300 us dollars um, and north of that, as more people adopt that kind of technology. Um, I know it briefly topped the $500 billion mark, um, making the network almost as valuable um, as uh, more valuable even than Visa. Um, you know, I think you're today about 400% up, far outperforming Bitcoin's gains percentage wise. Um, there are some questions in the audience asking, is Ether or altcoins in general the better crypto play here? Um, Zach, I'm going to kick it off with you. What do you think? Yeah, you know, I'm notorious for not supporting uh, altcoins. And when I say altcoins, you know, I'm referring to all the new coins, that, you know, like, like uh, Shiva, for example. This is a coin that I would never personally ever touch. Um, and it's, it's, it's the same kind of investment thesis that I have across the board. My portfolio right now is 100% ETH. Um, and it's been like that for quite a while. Um, but actually back in 20, late 2015, 2016, I converted all my Bitcoin to Ethereum. And I haven't had Bitcoin. I mean, I've had like a few, you know, a few change here and there, but I haven't had any considerable amount of Bitcoin since. Um, and at the time, yeah, Ethereum was considered an altcoin, but now, you know, because Ethereum came around and now you have, you know, thousands and thousands of tokens on top of it, these are the coins that I'm referring to. I would definitely say that to answer that, that user's question, um, no, Bitcoin and Ethereum, the blue chip coins is the play for crypto. You know, uh, you, you also mentioned earlier that someone else asked, like, is this for traders or is this a long-term investment? And the way I look at crypto is as a retirement fund. Right. Um, and so it's very much long term. And what is not long term is tokens. Right. Tokens come and go. You know, if you've been around and you saw the 2017 cycle and you saw the cycle before that, you'll know that a lot of coins appear and then disappear um, and they never come back. Right. And so in that sense, you really just want to have exposure to blue chip coins. It's like asking if penny stocks are the way to go in terms of long-term investing. The answer is like, no, of course not, right? You always want to have your exposure to, you know, FANG stocks and, and traditional, you know, very large cap stocks. So that's, that's, that's my own personal investment thesis, of course. And I, I think you bring up a good point here. And I, and I'm, I get a sense that a lot, many people in the audience are probably thinking about the same thing, you know, like with, with this explosive rise really in, in Bitcoin altcoins and the cryptocurrency space in general, right? It's, it's attracted a lot of kind of like new investors or at least curious investors eager to profit from it. But that's not the only group it's, it's attracted really. Um, this rise in popularity, I think in, in some ways uh, are playing into scammers and hackers hands, right? Um, especially since crypto is unknown territory to many new players. Um, I'm going to pose this question first to Bill, and, and we'll see if um, the, other, uh, uh, the other panelists here in the group um, would like to weigh in. But what advice would you give to the majority when it comes to protection, really, against 
um, all these uncertainty and, and like mystery that shrouds around the sector, Bill? Uh, yeah, sure. So I think from like a in investment perspective, like um, it, it's really about building a, a healthy portfolio. Um, I would never suggest the people to go all in on even Bitcoin or Ethereum. Like um, it is just like a very volatile asset class in nature. Uh, so when you want to get any sort of explorer into crypto world, uh, you, you need to have like a portfolio. And really till today, like, like as we have seen on the data, like all, all these stuff like Bitcoin, Ethereum, and all these application layer of tokens, they are just working on different uh, directions. Uh, you know, they have very different risk reward. Uh, you know, Bitcoin is like a digital gold. And I always tell people that like buying Bitcoin as a $1 trillion market cap is actually a safer bet compared to buying it at a, when it was at a $10 billion market cap. Uh, and for Ethereum, like it is more like, you know, this VC type of um, like investment target, like just uh, betting on the future, betting on uh, building applications, being the infrastructure. Uh, so, you know, all of them have very different natures, even though still you could see like very high correlations uh, in the short term, but over the long term across the years, uh, they're gonna perform very differently. Uh, and my, my advice is just to uh, try to diversify uh, in the crypto universe as much as possible, because uh, at the end of the day, you, you're not gonna know like, who, well, you know, who, who will be the, be the winner. Like uh, it's still too early to see. And uh, you know, like humans are just very bad at predict the future. Uh, uh, so I assume there may be some new other cool technology coming out uh, anytime from anywhere, you know. So having a portfolio is important. Shane, anything to add? Yeah, about portfolio construction in crypto. Basically, just look at it in the same lens as you would a traditional stock portfolio, right? Uh, so, you know, occasionally you have, uh, say, cyclicals, uh, outperforming defenses, and then um, you know, uh, of, of course, over the past 10 years, uh, the entire stock market has gone up. So a huge amount of, of uh, the returns that we've seen from the stock market is mostly beta-based returns, right? So if you were to project this over into crypto, okay, say you had a one-year horizon in 2018 or 2019, right? And you said that, okay, Ethereum is going to outperform because it can do this, blah, 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 right? And if you look at a one-year time horizon, your re investment returns are not going to be great, okay? But if you hold for like three years, four years, five years, you know, as we can see from today's uh, Ethereum price, it's much higher, right? So the idea is that regardless of whether or not it's a bull market or bear market, you want to pick up, uh, as uh, Zach and Bill have mentioned, uh, those sort of blue chip tokens, uh, you want to identify them in advance. And uh, when the price gets uh, favorable, just, uh, you know, go in with size. Uh, I mean, I mean, up to your uh, relevant uh, tolerance, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you want to make your returns on alpha and not beta, right? Hmm. Good advice. So I'm, 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 because of time, I'm really actually going to just shift gears right now, I'd rather zoom out a little bit more and talk about the wonderful world of decentralized finance, DeFi. Um, before we do that, um, I want to hear a little bit more from the crowd. I know some of you have mentioned uh, your interest in talking about DeFi, but specifically, guys, now is your moment. I'm going to try um, and, and see if we can get some answers from the audience. What is a pain point in the traditional banking and finance system that you just cannot wait to see some sort of disruption? Let us know what you think. Um, I, I'll, I'll continue to look out for all these comments, questions, spots, and, and kind of um, uh, commentary, and I'll read it out later as, as our League of Extra Extraordinary, Extraordinary Gentlemen uh, get them to weigh in and comment on your question. Um, but first, um, kicking off the whole DeFi chat, you know, just the other day, my grandma was asking me, I'm not even kidding you. I'm, I think she might be tuning in right now. <laughs> you know, if you're listening in, hi, grandma. Um, but uh, my grandma was just asking me, really, what is DeFi? What is decentralized finance? I tried to explain it to her. 
I think I was struggling a little bit. So let's go around the room, starting with Ignis. Um, how would you explain DeFi to grandma? Oh, that put me on the spot. I, I think in a way, like those concepts are maybe easier to explain what they can do uh, instead of what they are. So maybe I'll try kind of like pound on that uh, before I, if, if I'll see if I can come up with a more kind of like definition thing. So I think the benefit about DeFi is really uh, the way I see it. Um, one of the one of the key uh, uh, um, improvement upon the traditional system is that it's real time settlement. So when when you think about the kind of the traditional uh, capital market, it takes a plus T plus two uh, two day to to really settle and clear anything. Um, so the capital efficiency is not uh, as high. When you think about kind of like, say like a DeFi that is built, um, a DeFi protocol that is built on the Ethereum uh, blockchain, um, you're looking at um, block time about uh, 12, 13 seconds. So uh, you can fit however many 12, 13 seconds in the space of two days. And that's kind of like a 10,000 times capital efficiency when compared to the traditional finance system. Um, yeah. And you know, people. There's a. I think part and parcel with that. There's a lower kind of threshold of entry. So till this day, the traditional banking system works to the exclusion of uh, thirty percent of the world's population, whereas DeFi, uh, it basically has a, a much lower minimal threshold. So it allows more people to participate, and uh, the system is more inclusive. Um, it does take a little bit of technological know-how. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of uh, hand-holding, um, but yeah, that is my take. Great. Zach, weigh in here. How would you explain DeFi? Oh, well, you know, I was thinking about that and how would I explain it to a grandma? Um, and I think the best way I would say, it, I, I simplified a lot. And I would just say that it's a, it's a borrowing and lending system, you know, on the blockchain. So you can borrow and lend your money um, and then, of course, there's all sorts of variations of that. And then, you know, get into the advanced mechanics behind it. You know, there's, there's derivatives you can do. There's options you can do. You know, it's, it's a financial um, platform. It's a financial platform that is really open to anyone and is not limited to the jurisdiction of where you are. Um, and I think that's the easiest, broadest way and simplest way to explain it to someone. Uh, because, you know, you, we, we can talk for hours on DeFi in this panel. Yeah. Um, and so you really kind of, it's one of those learning experiences where once you dive into the rabbit hole of DeFi, you know, you don't come out until like five days later, you're like, oh, I need to shave, I need to shower, <laughs> I've been diving into it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, that's how I would, that's how I would go down that. Oh, I've been there. I've been there. In fact, I think I probably just like cleaned up myself just for the session. Before this, I was in the whole DeFi cave for, um, for the longest time. Um, <laughs> but um. Shane, uh, I'm, I'm switching gears a little bit here, but diving a little bit deeper into this, this whole DeFi thing. What do you think, Shane, is the most important, um, why is it important to learn about DeFi, especially against this kind of macro background, right? In times of economic turmoil, uncertainty, and really just massive central bank intervention from a macro scale, why is this important? Yeah, so basically, uh... You know, for most of our lives, uh, I'm sure pretty much everyone who's in this room right now is so used to the traditional finance banking system, right? It's everything that we've been taught uh, to deal in, uh, to live with uh, through our entire lives. So, you know, uh, for most of us, you know, including myself, before I came across the DeFi ecosystem, uh, you know, it was un unimaginable that there could be something outside of it. So I guess... The first thing that uh, interested me was, of course, the crazy, fat, juicy yields that you see in DeFi, right? On, on say, like uh, dollar stable coins, right? Like, like way uh, outperforms anything you get on your bank deposits, right? But if you go further down the rabbit hole and then you're going to look at how the protocols are built, right? How governance is done, uh, the economic designs, how the tokens are done. And then you realize like, oh, hey, you know, there, there is a, maybe there is a, a different way of doing things around, right? And maybe things don't have to be so inefficient, you know? So I think at, at the very least is a, an, an incredible 
real world iterative process of educating the world about what is possible uh, going forward into the future, right? Hmm. And um, Agnes, I see, I see a question from Ger Gerard, Gerard Lim. Gerard Lim, sorry if I butchered your name. Cryptocurrencies like BTC are highly volatile and not backed by any government like fiat currencies. What do you see that is required to stabilize and make crypto more practical in the real world? Ignis. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, I think it's, I was, I was just commenting on, it's kind of about perspective taking. So we call something a stable coin because it's pegged to the value of a dollar, but is the dollar stable? Like, uh, you know, the Fed talks about like it's been 2% uh, inflation. I mean, they, they talk about kind of like the current inflation might be transitory, but when you look at uh, lum, uh, a lumber wood has grown more than 330% uh, this year. We are looking at uh, cotton has grown by double digit, uh, copper, um, you know, coffee. Um, all those commodities, they are growing at uh, a speed that is much higher than, uh, you know, the purported inflation rate. Um, really, like, if, if we decide the only thing that is the measure of value uh, is, is, is central bank currency, then, yeah, perhaps uh, uh, some of the cryptocurrencies are, are volatile. But, uh, you know, for uh, some of the people who have kind of like, uh, you know, turned uh, against uh, um, uh, the fiat world and really embraced uh, crypto, uh, they would think that uh, crypto is a better um, um, haven for, safe haven for value. And, and uh, I saw like a couple of questions about kind of like, the, is, is the central bank digital currency, is, uh, is the central bank digital currency going to make uh, uh, Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies obsolete? I think, yeah, these are, um, these are kind of like, different use cases. So uh, cryptocurrencies, that might be a little bit of like a simplification or misnomer. It's not just a currency as um, all my uh, panelists have talked about. It's uh, it's a digital gold, even though kind of it's maybe like a hundred times better than gold. Um, it is, uh, you know, people use it for remittance, remittances um, when they are working overseas. And, uh, you know, uh, it's a, it's a uh, information repository that uh, uh, you know, sends out information and collects information at the speed of light. Uh, you know, you can mint uh, uh, photos and uh, and uh, art, arts on, on top of blockchain. Uh, uh, Q, Zach. So uh, I think in, in one particular use case, when you talk about kind of like a, a, a use as a digital currency for like day-to-day -day, uh, settlement, uh, this is already something uh, that uh, uh, Bitcoin or maybe some of the other uh, uh, cryptocurrencies are moving, moving away from. If anything, uh, central bank digital currency might pose a threat for the stable coins like uh, Tether, like uh, USDC, like uh, DAI, even though kind of DAI have a, a more of a, a use case in decentralized finance, which uh, central bank digital currency doesn't seem to be getting in. Whereas, uh, um, like the Bitcoin and the, the large cap altcoins, they are serving uh, different purposes and they are seen as uh, for different purposes. And another thing is central bank digital currency is not a cryptocurrency. Uh, mm -hmm. Not all of them are crypto uh, uh, graphically uh, protected and all of, them, all of them are built on a blockchain. Uh, like one thing about cryptography is, uh, you know, the uh, privacy part. Uh, we, we know some famously uh, uh, um, sort of like uh, uh, publicized cryptocurrency, uh, central bank digital currency, CBDCs, they do not have uh, uh, privacy. Actually, uh, the uh, ECB, uh, uh, ECB actually famously came out and said, maybe people don't value privacy that much when it comes to uh, their money. So uh, I beg to defer, but I think kind of like uh, uh, those are for different use cases. And, uh, uh, we don't need to conflate them. Speaking of use cases, Bill, I want to kind of direct this question to you. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're learning a little bit about DeFi concepts, right? And I, I think for, for some of our friends in the audience, they might be thinking, what can I do now, maybe, in DeFi, right? How do I get started? And I guess a, a more fun question for you, Bill, is um, what kind of DeFi platforms excite you personally? Um, yeah, this is a really good question. So um, I have many friends around me like, like uh, asking me like, how do I participate into DeFi? Um, I think for the average, uh, you know, like user or just uh, wanna 
being like a passive investor into this space. Uh, what they could do is they, they just uh, need to download like a cryptocurrency wallet, like uh, just like a Chrome plugin, like called MetaMask. Uh, and they installed on the Chrome browser uh, and then um, buy some crypto like Ethereum or whatever tokens and uh, send it to, to their MetaMask. Uh, and then they could start doing something like liquidity mining or farming. Basically, just another way of saying like um, like buying some investment products with, with a limited risk um, on the blockchain. Like um, you know that that's one of the most direct way uh, to participant. Uh, you know, learning by investing. Um, for example, what you could do is like if you have some uh, Ethereum, um, you could just uh, transfer those Ethereum you bought on the exchange to your MetaMask wallet. Uh, and then you could deposit your Ethereum onto some decentralized lending protocol. Uh, and then they will pay you interest because someone else is gonna borrow those Ethereum. Uh, you don't need to worry about the, the security that much because everything is very transparent. Like uh, they are basically controlled by the smart contract. There won't be any centralized party that could actually do anything about your assets. Uh, and then they build some like a risk management model to control uh, the people who could borrow the money and uh, they guarantee that they will pay you back with some interest. So I think that's that's very fascinating because it enables like a lot of like, uh, like a broader market basically. You know, the traditional banking world isn't fully competitive. Uh, you know, you got to have some connections to do the banking business. But in this DeFi world, every single developer, if you know how to write code, you could set up a bank, basically, coding code bank. Um, and it just enables so much possibility out there. Um, so so that, that's, that's just my two cents on how to get started. Uh, talking about my, my like a favorite like a platform, um, you know, I, I'm just uh, too fascinated about what, what, what uh, like so much innovation in the space. Um, very interested in the space of this uh, decentralized uh, trading platform. Uh, you know, because Bybit, we, we are coming from the traditional derivatives trading, uh, like a platform. Uh, when we see like, you know, uh, this Uniswap, SushiSwap, uh, it's just fascinating, like, like with, with under uh, fewer than 20 people, like, like a very small organization, um, they, they, they build a tremendous amount of trading volume out there. Um, so. I mean, on one hand side, they, sh they present us with like very uh, good uh, user experience, but also on the other hand side, they also present the possibility of uh, a small and uh, like a distributed organization. Um, and and that's, that's beautiful as well. Uh, so just uh, like very passionate about on that as well. Learning new stuff every single day. Nice. I, likewise, I too am learning new stuff every single day. And I think that's part of the most exciting things about not just the job, but also just being in the space at this time, right? Um, Zach, you know, we mentioned a couple of use cases. I'm really curious to hear from you. How do you view NFT's role in DeFi? And I'm also um, getting a question from the audience from Elston Sam. Uh, for Zach, what are your thoughts on ETH being the layer of uh, layer one for NFTs? Uh, mentioned pros and cons compared to the other layer one like Flow. Zach, weigh in here. Yeah, you know NFTs are really versatile assets. They can be pretty much anything digitally, um, and so I believe there's a few platforms out there right now that utilize them in DeFi where the NFT itself is. You know, um, for example, I think in this one situation, it's a it's your option. So whether it's a call or a put, that comes to you in the form of an NFT. Uh, now, that simplifies some things in terms of the smart contracts and how they implement that process in their smart contracts. But it also gives you a new opportunity to you know take that option and do with it what you want. You know, you can send it to your friend, you can sell it on another marketplace, uh, and that's really unique because that's not something that you can do in the traditional finance world. Um, you know, like if I, if I open up an option on E-Trade, I can't, you know, send that to my buddy. And I also can't go sell it on another platform, at least not easily. Um, whereas with crypto, you know, it's, it's very easy. You can just transfer it right away. Um, so NFTs have 
a ton of potential to be used with financial platforms and as financial assets, but it's really limited to the creativity of the developer and how they build out that financial platform. And whether that financial platform includes, you know, the, the need or the use case of NFTs just depends on them. Um, so I think, you know, you, you can almost have, you know, almost, uh, so if you look at like Aave or Curve, I don't see a reason why everything couldn't be utilized as an NFT where you, when you borrow or lend out something, you actually utilize an NFT to facilitate that, right? Now, you wouldn't really do that in the real world just because it's going to increase the cost, increase transactions and increase friction. So, you know, what, what Aave and Curve have built is, is trying to be as smooth as possible uh, and do, you know, uh, be as versatile as possible. Uh, but it could happen, right? And so that's just an example of how versatile NFTs are. Now, to the user's question about whether Ethereum is a layer one um, or another blockchain is a layer one, uh, ultimately, I think that it is going to end up being Ethereum as the, the base layer for NFTs. Um, and we've already seen layer twos come out uh, related to NFTs that utilize the base layer, such as like Immutable X, right? That's a ZK rollup solution that utilizes um, some really cool math and allows for you to do everything without a transaction, uh, but then it's all you know, secured by the Ethereum mainnet. Um, and that's, that's really cool because there's less friction for a user in that point, but there's also um, you know, better security knowing that, for example, Polygon. Polygon's a side chain. Um, it's essentially its own separate blockchain. Uh, and it's got quite a vibrant DeFi ecosystem on it right now, but the way that it's set up there's around, I want to say eight people. It's a very small number of people that essentially control the entire side chain. And so you have, I think, you know, it's, it's billions of dollars locked up on this platform, you know, on the side chain that is essentially controlled by a very small number of people. Um, and that in and of itself is scary because even your bank has more, uh, you know, decentralized control in that manner. There's regulation in that manner. Um, and so it's almost like we're going backwards, right? When you, so you have to look at these different solutions and how it's going to play out um, with something like Polygon, uh, Matic Polygon, uh, that, that side chain, that is the kind of the base layer for NFTs if you utilize that for your NFT. So you can make an NFT on that you know, side chain. It's going to live there. Now you can withdraw it to Ethereum, but you don't have to do that. Ethereum doesn't have to come into play at all you can focus solely on that side chain. And what you're doing then is you're jeopardizing one, the longevity of your NFT, you're jeopardizing the security of your NFT, and you're also jeopardizing the ability, um, think of it liquidity, right? You're, you're jeopardizing the, the access to liquidity because when you use a side chain like that, there's just not the same number of users that you have on Ethereum. Ethereum's the, the most used blockchain, right? And so it's got the most users, it's got the most economic value transacting on it. Um, and you know, that speaks, that speaks for a, a lot. And so when you ask something like flow, is flow going to overtake Ethereum as the base layer? No, no just because it's got, you know, a smoother user experience uh, in terms of transaction times and transaction fees doesn't necessarily mean it's going to overtake. You know, Mark Cuban actually just did a little tweet about this a few days ago where it doesn't matter if your technology is better. What matters is the marketing, the community, the network. And when you look at something like Ethereum, it's so far ahead. The network effect is so powerful that it's, there's really no ETH killers out there. You see a lot of people talking about like, you know, Cardano or, um, you know, even like Binance or all these things as like ETH killers. But realistically, um, they're nowhere near. Uh, they're nowhere near the network effect. They're nowhere near the capabilities. They're nowhere near the, uh, the you know, the locked value on that blockchain itself. Um, and so all these things play a role. And so ultimately, I think ETH is definitely here to stay. It, it, it's effectively on the same level of Bitcoin, where Bitcoin is going to be here in 20 years. I believe Ethereum is going to be here in 20 years as well. Right now, for any other project, um, we can't necessarily say that, right? That, that's, that's a very strong statement, Zach. And, I, and I'm not sure if, 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 if um, Bill, Ignis, or Shane have anything to add. If you do, just give me a wave and I'll pull you in. But um, I think we're, we're really hearing a lot of these benefits and like, you know, um, kind of like the upsides and potentials of DeFi, right? But I'm also getting um, a couple of comments from the audience um, asking about 
some of the risks involved, right? And I think um, let's 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 talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, Kelvin Chua saying there are many clone DeFi's out there. How do we determine which are clones or which are legit? How to avoid rug pu rug pulls? Um, I think several other. Um, uh, I'm just trying to scroll through all these comments, but there there, there were a couple of. Um, uh, mentions here about the risks involved. Um, let's bring in Ignis, who's nodding right now. <laughs> Ignis, you kick it off. Um, Bill and Shane, Zach, feel free to weigh in, jump in after Ignis is done. I think, yeah, it's it's the old kind of like, there's no shortcut, you have to do your own research. Uh, as much as, uh, uh, you know, uh, everyone can show you uh, whatever project they are um, promoting. I think uh, nothing is as 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 solid and uh, as reliable as your own research. Um, yeah, because it's a fast moving uh, industry. Because like you know, people talk uh, draw comparison with the Wild West. Um, in, in any kind of like new emerging uh, market, there is going to be bad actors. Uh, I think you know you you have to kind of do your research and look at um, the project, look at the team. Uh, what are the things that matter to them what are the um you know uh ethos they are trying to project from what they are trying to build what are the uh, uh technological advances they are making against uh, uh they're forking from a separate project i think um, all these are important like there's it's there's just nothing that beats uh, your own research Shane, would you like to weigh in here? Yeah, so basically a uh, general rule of thumb that you can go by is you can simply look at uh, TVL rankings. That's uh, total value locked rankings for uh, a lot of the major protocols out there, right? Those that with a strong track record, those that have uh, proven their ability in handling a huge amount, like billions of uh, liquidity. Um, Obviously, that is a very uh, rough and unscientific way of doing it, but uh, nothing matters more than real world validation, right? So I will start with TVL first, and then you go in depth into the project itself and uh, see what uh, uh, you find from there, right? And as Ignia said, then you have to do your own research. Uh, the main difference between uh, DeFi research and uh, say like traditional equity research is that, you know, in DeFi, maybe you got to look at financials, you got you got to do some projections, but on top of that, you have to also understand the technical smart contract risk, right? So um, I saw a question from uh, one of the audience basically asking, oh, oh so what happens if uh, one of these projects get hacked, right? So obviously that is always a risk. If you are technically super inclined, you can read through the code of each protocol and figure out if there's a logical flow here and there. And theoretically, while there is no backstop to uh, sort of types of economic hacks that we've seen in the past, the industry has developed a way to deal with uh, these kinds of problems, right? So like, especially this year, a lot of the hacks that we've seen, the community has actually come together to compensate users uh, when these type of uh, big hacks happen, right? So you can think of it as a validation of the decentralization uh, concept. And uh, finally, when you look at DeFi tokens, I mean, let's just be honest here, right? Uh, we're all looking at crypto because the returns are amazing, right? Compared to anything else that we see out there, right? That's the number one point of interest for all of us. Okay, so you have to gauge your uh, return expectations against the risk that you are taking, right? Maybe you don't have this kind of like economic hack kind of risk uh, that you see in uh, traditional equities, but is the return going to be the same? So you have to look at all your returns or your risks in, in that uh, perspective. Yeah. Speaking of returns, um, <laughs> the wonderful world of NFTs. I have a question coming from the audience saying, I think NFT is more crazy than anything else. How could digital painting cost millions of dollars or more? Zach, you know, before we launch in, I mean, I, I have to say congratulations for building such an awesome platform. Uh, you know, I'm a fan. I'm so glad to have you here. Um, Tell us a little bit about the, the, the wonderful and crazy world of NFTs and you know, tell, tell us a little bit about 
um, Mintable for friends just learning about this. What is Mintable? What do you guys do? And what gets you personally excited uh, about coming to work every day? Yeah, NFTs are absolutely amazing, right? When I found NFTs uh, before, you know, before we really uh, had a standard for them, before they had the terms, before they were used, um, I was just like everyone else. And I was like, eh, what is this? This doesn't have value. It wasn't until later, a few months later, and seeing them pop up again, did I realize like, okay, wait, hold on. This is a really versatile item. This can be, you know, insurance policies. This can be artwork. This can be game items. This can be music. This could affect a lot of potential industries. Um, and, and they really can, right? And they will. And that's what we're seeing right now is we've seen a lot of media attention around NFTs. And we're seeing a lot of people understanding and utilizing NFTs because if you ask someone to explain DeFi, it's a lot harder than asking them to explain NFTs. NFTs are inherently easier to understand for the mass market, for the consumer, for normal everyday people. Um, you know, even my mom, you mentioned your grandma was asking about DeFi, like, oh my God, that's insane. Um, but, you know, my grandma hasn't gotten that far yet. But, but my mom, she understands what an NFT is. In fact, she's made an NFT on Mintable. Well, we try to make it extremely easy. Um, and we take a pride, you know, that my mom has made an NFT on Mintable. Um, but essentially, Mintable is an open marketplace for you to buy, sell, trade NFTs, right? Whether you don't have any crypto um, and you want to get involved in NFTs, the only place to do that is actually on Mintable. Uh, you know, you can make an NFT without needing any crypto and you can buy an NFT with your credit card, right? And so all these things are really easy for a user to start interacting with opposed to something like DeFi where you need to have, you know, thousands of dollars to really even be able to make a dent or have any kind of decent returns within a DeFi platform. Um, it's also complicated, right? It's just, it's, it's, it's a ton of research and understanding that you do before you dive into it. With NFTs, it's much easier. You know, a user asks, why is a, a, is a piece of artwork millions of dollars? Um, and I, I think that, you know, that, that's a very easy question to answer. Uh, artwork is obviously valued by the, the person who's buying it. Um, and so for whatever piece you're talking about, that was obviously valued by that buyer for millions of dollars. But on the other, the actual explanation is why are NFTs worth millions of dollars? Um, the, the really easy way to understand this is that you have something that is uh, on a public ledger. So everyone can look at it, access it, verify it. It can't be duplicated. It can't be copied. It's unique. And if it's coming from someone who's reputable, like say Beeple or some other famous creator, then you can trust that you know, they're not going to make duplicates of it or whatever. They're not going to make copies of it. Just like, you know, you, you trust that with like Banksy, right? You trust that Banksy isn't going to release a thousand extra prints after he, you know, released the first 100 or whatever. Um, and so because of all those things, you now have something that is inherently valuable because it's coming from someone of a high caliber. It's verifiably authentic. It cannot be duplicated. It can't be, um, you know, forged and it's treatable. And so when you have all those things combined, there's now economic value behind this asset. And so then you go, okay, well, it's tradable. How do I, you know, how do I value this? How do I get money for it? Why is it not $10? Why is it $10 million? And the answer to that is the potential upside, right? It may start at $10. In fact, the Beeple auction that went for $70 million started at, I want to say $200 was what their initial auction opening was. And a lot of people were kind of freaked out because they're like, this is Beeple. This guy's famous. You're doing it for $200. What's wrong with you, Christie's? And, you know, it ended at, what, $70 million? So there's a huge difference in where it starts and where it ends. And, and that's the same thing with the NFT that you're buying. Maybe you buy it for $10, but someone wants to buy it for $1,000 next. And then once that person has it, they can find someone else that wants to buy it for $2,000, right? And that price and the valuation continues to go up based off of those inherent values. So I think that's a really easy explanation of NFTs and why they're valuable. Whether it's artwork, music, or insurance policies, NFTs can really apply to anything. Um, and with Mintable, we built a platform to facilitate that. Whether you want to make an NFT or you want to trade NFTs, you know, you can do that on Mintable. Is it all about value, though? Because I mean, there, there's there's this wide spectrum of, of of people and kind of like just basically what the NFT offers, right? Um, but I mean, I know that some people kind of just want to own it just because it's something fun. Some people want bragging rights. I mean, do you think there's more to it than just value? Ignis, I see your hand. Let's have you weigh in first and then we'll have Zach. Go. Cool. 
I think I just want to make a tangential observation to what Zach said about reselling. I think one thing that I really like about uh, NFTs is you can sort of like uh, code it into the uh, smart contract wherein the original creator of the artwork gets a cut whenever it's resold. I think that is like uh, so far the best model I have seen that kind of like really uh, gives back to to the actual creator. You know, all those Van Hoogs, I like to pronounce it in the original Dutch way, and the, you know, the Leonardo's, they are not seeing any of the money for which the uh, artwork is sold. Uh, but uh, for someone like Beepo, uh, he is already seeing like some of his uh, uh, lesser, not lesser, but like smaller creations. I think I, I read somewhere he sold them for like $1 each, one uh, whatever currency each. Um, and then people just starting started to resell it and, and he's getting like 10% cut for each of the resale. So I think this, um, if nothing else, the, the kind of like the, the way NFT really respects uh, uh, creativity and really gives back to people who are actually creator is 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 something that I really like. Yeah, I, I think, Ignis, you bring a really good point because I feel like the, the whole NFT scene, to me personally, right? Um, and I was talking about this a couple of friends just over the weekend. It, it almost kind of uh, provides a new opportunity and kind of lifts the whole, uh, if I may, starving artist almost kind of stigma, right? Like, um, you know, we're, we're seeing many new artists kind of choosing the NFT route and almost ditching the, the whole, I mean, not the whole, but kind of setting aside the traditional art scene entirely. Do you see this guys as kind of a, 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 an opportunity for the art scene in general? I know Zach, you mentioned that NFTs is a lot more than just art, there's also music and anything really that, that, that provides value. Yeah, and you know, it is, empowering content creators, kind of like the gig economy empowered independent workers to be able to kind of take their, you know, their job and their, their career in their own hands of how many hours they want to work. Uh, that's the same with NFTs. And it's really powerful in that sense. And yeah, it does change the stigma kind of for the starving artist stigma. You still have to realize that the NFT market is very small in the sense that there's only a handful of creators who are making millions of dollars. So it's, it's, it's very similar to the traditional art you know, scene in the sense that there's only a handful of artists that are selling things in Christie's and Sotheby's. There's only a handful of galleries that you're gonna be able to have access to, right? And there's millions and millions of artists and creators around there that are just not being able to you know, get their artworks displayed in galleries or you know, sell something in auction at Christie's or Sotheby's. And it's the same with NFTs in that regards because it's so new. Of course, you know, we were projected to do um, around 1.5 billion this year in global NFT sales. Um, we have done over 2 billion already. So now we're on track to hit around 4 billion. From last year, we only did 330 million. So it's a huge growth, right? And the next year that we're looking at, you know, we can't really make an accurate prediction at this point because we just don't know where things are going, but it's an insane amount of growth and it's only gonna continue. It gets to the point where it's going to become an everyday uh, part of our society, just like USB or ATM or DVD, TV, NFT, right? They're all going to be a part of our society in some way, shape, or form. And it's just another medium for content creators to utilize. I, I do want to mention on Ignis, you talked about uh, the royalty. That's actually a problem that the Ethereum Foundation gave me a grant to solve. And we created EIP 2981 which is a standard for on-chain royalties that's really close to being finalized and being you know, approved as an ERC, which is you know, a standard on Ethereum. Uh, and it's really cool because it right now, if you go on different platforms, if you go on Mintable or Rarible or OpenSea, and you do royalties on each one of these platforms, they don't communicate because it's all in a centralized database. And so we needed some sort of on-chain mechanism to handle these royalties. And so this is, again, one of the things that, um, that I take pride in. Uh, because what well, I made the standard, but I take pride in it because Mintable has pushed forward the NFT space in so many different ways, from a royalty standard like this to the first DAO that runs off of NFTs, right? And it kind of a, it's kind of a DeFi thing, but not we don't we don't call it a DeFi thing just because you know uh, we just don't want it. We're an NFT platform, uh, but and then like gasless minting and batch minting. So royalties is a really important aspect that needs to be solved so that every platform can work across you know across the board. And it's, it's something, yeah, exactly, interoperability. It's something that has to just happen. Yeah. Nice. 
with um, final two minutes left for, for this segment, guys, let's talk about meme economy. We haven't talked about this at all for the past one hour. The comments come flooding in since the beginning of this webinar, really. Um, let's just probably streamline it down to how memes and NFTs work. I know um, I've seen a couple being shared around, uh, you know, um, various chat groups and communities, meme economy and NFTs, how do they come together? No takers, not yeah. all at once, guys. <clears throat> Yeah, I feel I feel all this, um, you know, this um, all these meme tokens, um, you know. To be honest, I am not sure about like like the effect of all these meme coins are gonna bring to the space. You know, in the short term, we're gonna see a lot of this uh, pump and dump stuff, uh, and that's really gonna hurt investors. Uh, they may lose some confidence. Um, but you know, over the long period of time, like once they, they get into this space, they may have some chance to look around, like uh, they won't really hold meme coins forever. They're gonna look around, maybe see Bitcoin, maybe Ethereum. So I think in the long term, that's a good thing. It, it does bring new traffic, like the outside capital uh, to the crypto world. Um, so, but, but, you know, like, I just want to really cautious here, like about this meme coins. Um, I personally, um, won't, won't really like attach any of these meme coins myself. Um, but I did buy some, uh, uh buy, buy some dot coin before <laughs> actually on my rock account, but, but that was just for fun. Sounds good. Well, gentlemen, I'm afraid, um, we've run against the heartbreak here and, um, the good news is, though, we um, have a lot of questions coming in, really, from the audience. I'm, I'm going to read some out to you, and you guys can jump in uh, on your uh, with your views. But um, at the same time, um, you know, Shane, Zach, Bill, Ignis, uh, feel, feel free to kind of um, look through the Q and A comment section, pick out the ones that you want to answer, and uh, we'll take it from there. But first up, I have an NFT related one from Devon M. Um, how do you see consumers in Southeast Asia or ASEAN adopting NFTs? Do you think platform or exchanges led, uh, exchange led or creative art, are these platform exchange led or creative or artist led? It's a good question. And, you know, I actually get that a lot because I'm based in Singapore and, you know, how is NFTs applied to the Asian markets? There's a lot of potential ways that Asian culture applies to NFTs and really nice, they, they fit really well together uh, and they haven't taken off yet. Of course, NFTs are still really new. And so in the sense of, you know, when are we going to start seeing all the large brands, all the collectibles, all the boba shops have NFTs? I think it's only a matter of time. Um, and whether or not it's led by an exchange or by an artist, I don't think that's much of a question because an exchange can't really lead a NFT kind of revolution. An exchange is limited to what they can release and it's never going to lead to widespread adoption. That would be like saying if um, having, you know, one cryptocurrency leads to widespread adoption, it just won't, right? You have to have a diverse ecosystem. Um, and so it's always gonna be led by the creators now, when you're talking about something like, say, a uh, Gundam collectible and the brand behind that, that would be counted as a creator in the sense that they're creating, you know, assets that are traded um, and collected by users. And then their competitor would, of course, do the same thing. And then their competitor would do the same thing, right? And now you're building out this ecosystem that wherever you go, you're going to see on the box when you're buying that Gundam is basically comes with NFT. Right. And then it's a part of your life, regardless of if you want it or not. Um, and, I, you know, I think that's kind of the future that we're going to see there. And especially with Asia, it's more inclined to happen um, quicker in terms of you're going to see it when you go to the store than it will be in, say, America or Canada. Speaking of kind of like region, you know, region specific or like country specific um, behaviors. Right. Shane, um, I was, you know, share some insights into how. Um, different, I guess, uh, crypto investors and trader sentiments and behaviors are, uh, depending on what on what kind of region they're coming from. Yeah, so 
I'm going to talk about this in a very macro, high level point of view, right? So if you look at investing in general, whether or not it's uh, crypto or equities or bonds, um, the Western world has a very, uh, when I talk about Western world, I'm talking about uh, Western Europe and the US, right? Um, it's very well, highly developed uh, financial industry, right? So a huge part of the household wealth in the US is actually uh, concentrated in uh, paper instruments such as uh, uh, the SPY ETF, which mirrors the S&P 500 portfolio, so on and so forth. And hence, you see products like Grayscale's GPTC uh, becoming so popular in the US and you see such huge inflows, especially last year, right? So uh, the, the West, people see crypto in the Western world a bit more in a long-term passive investment kind of mindset, right? You come to Asia, of course, most of our audience is uh, from Asia, right? And obviously everyone sees the point of view of a passive portfolio, but uh, I'm going to use Singapore or China as an example. Huge part of household wealth is actually concentrated in something that is physical that you can touch like real estate, right? Hence you see such a gigantic property bubble in, uh, especially in East Asia and in Singapore, right? So from that angle, um, uh, to a certain extent, you see more opportunistic kind of uh, entry and uh, participation in crypto markets. And a lot of the uh, institutional players here, be it hedge funds, be it uh, market makers, or even the average uh, uh, daily retail user, um, they tend to like to do things like uh, inter-exchange arbitrage, um, taking on huge leverage to make as much as they can, uh, so on and so forth. So. Um, there is a very distinct but subtle difference uh, uh, between uh, uh, what we see geographically. Hmm. That's good. I have a question coming in from various people, including Desmond and Shirley, about farming, farming and mining. And I think this is super exciting, especially for ooh, I, I think like Ignis, Bill, and Shane, who are um, kind of involved in in, in this these kinds of projects uh, in, in, in recent days. Um, farming, mining, cryptocurrencies, is it a reliable investment? And are there any trusty platforms for us to do farming? Um, also coming in from other questions, what do you think about liquidity farming, yield farming, um, and all that good stuff? Ignis, we'll kick it off with you. Go around, Bill and Shane. Um I, I think I was just going to uh, um, leave these questions to, to our uh, resident experts, uh, uh, Shane and Bill. Uh, I was just going to say kind of like, it's really just capital efficiency. Uh, when you look at kind of like, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of architecture and beautiful suits like, um, and, and everything. But when you think about kind of like the banking system, it occupies the most expensive uh, uh, real estate. It has the most beautiful architecture and, you know, everyone is wearing, uh, is, is making so much uh, uh, money in terms of their salary. Uh, essentially, that is just a uh, uh, value that is uh, uh, forked away by the intermediary. Uh, why can DeFi farming provide such good returns? Because uh, it removes the intermediary. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with uh, Ignis. Um, I mean, talking about this uh, farming, like really, if you look into DeFi, um, there are just a couple of things uh, fundamentally that you could do. Uh, one is lending and borrowing. Um, so that's like a building block. Uh, and the second one is the peer-to-peer uh, -peer trading. Um, you know, you could call it like a speculation or sometimes it's like investing. Um, but people trade with each other. Uh, so talking about the sustainability of this the farming, uh, you really need to understand what you are really fa farming, you know, um, it is really the, the yield from the business. Um, I do believe uh, it is sustainable in the long term because uh, the lending and the borrowing is no joke. It, it's just a providing utility. Uh, you know, it's like a bridging liquidity, reallocating the risk just like the traditional banking is doing. If you think traditional financial service is sustainable, uh, so does DeFi. Uh, it, it's all the same, it's just using different technology and to some extent better technology. And uh, with all this lending and borrowing, uh, you're gonna have people like uh, taking on leverage, uh, trying to exchanging assets, 
uh, try to releasing some liquidity for themselves. Uh, and you have all these DEXs. Uh, and all these DEXs are gonna produce a fee. Uh, just like we're running the business of exchange, like we know like how these things work. Um, for people trade, we, we could take a transaction fee. But on the DeFi, uh, it's actually the protocol is taking the fee. Um, and the, what, like being like a farmer in the DeFi space, you are just uh, getting paid for all these fees uh, by providing capital. Um, so in my opinion, it's very sustainable and it's really just the starting point of, of, of like a long journey over um, the next decade or two decades. Um, so that's my view. Nice. Okay, so, so over to me. Um, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna have to disagree with you there. So, <laughs> so I, I don't think you farming is very sustainable for majority of the projects that we're seeing out there. Uh, I mean, I won't get into the technical aspects of it, but uh, just to give a very simple metaphor, right? Uh, in the early days when ride hailing services and startups were coming out in Singapore, for example, uh, you used to be able to get like free coupons from Uber or Grab, right? And you could get free rides maybe every weekend, so on and so forth, right? So in that case, they were giving you all those freebies to incentivize your usage, right, of their service. In a sense, you farming serves that same purpose, right? It bootstraps liquidity into the protocol by giving you these tokens that they can sort of mint, like mint out of thin air, right? However, what Bill also said is true, which is some of the tokens that are minted, um, uh, they are not, uh, doesn't apply to every single project, but only applies to the top tier blue chip type of projects where you uh, can, for example, uh, some of the top DEXs or some of the other top uh, lending borrowing protocols, um, you can actually farm uh, tokens that are likely to sustain long-term value, right, and represent uh, governance rights in a protocol. And of course, a lot of that is a function of uh, tokenomics uh, design, right, in the short run, and long-term value accrual uh, when you talk about the really multi-year kind of time horizon. Nice. Yeah, actually, I, I believe uh, she and I are actually on the same page. Um, I, you know, like um, in short term, you're going to see like all this crazy yield, like 200% annualized, 300%. Um, I don't think that's going to be sustainable. But, you know, uh, because of the real business existing uh, in the DeFi world, like having like a yield of maybe like 15% or 20%, that's pretty sustainable in my opinion. Great. I think we do have time for one final question. So Zach, I'm gonna bring the spotlight back to you. I have a question from MC. Um, and I think it's a good one that, um, uh, that's, 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 uh, that a lot of people have been asking me personally as well. Um, is it possible to mint multiple NFTs from the same asset and then sell them on different platforms? Basically talking about how it works, um, since NFT ownership does not confer IP rights in the underlying asset, how would the issue of ownership be resolved in such scenarios? Yeah, so you can definitely mint the same asset. Let's let's remove the word asset here. Let's just replace it with like picture, right? Because that's kind of what most of it is. Um, and it just makes it easier to understand. So you can mint the same picture, you know, 50 times, 100 times, a million times as an NFT, but each individual NFT, which is a copy of the same picture, has its own identifier, which is a unique identifier. It's a serial number, if you want to think about it that way. Um, and so the very first one you make is going to be token number one, right? And then number two and then number three or whatever. And so from a collector standpoint, there's going to be a difference between token number one and token number 99, right? They're, they're in terms of rarity, in terms of scarcity, in terms of uh, collectability, number one is going to be more valuable. Uh, now, in terms of transferring IP, um, and, and actually, let's go back to that real quick. Why would someone not want to do that? Uh, or what would stop them from doing that? In the case of people, you know, his piece that he sold for $70 million, that piece, he could go make another one right now if he wanted to, right? But of course, if he did that, no one would ever buy any more of his works because they don't know if he's going to do that again and devalue what they're buying, right? And so it's a complete way to, you know, destroy your reputation instantly. Um, and you can actually build in mechanisms into the smart contract that stop him from, say, 
go in and make it any more. You can only make one item, um, but we don't really see that very often. Uh, it's more about trust with the person you're buying. Uh, as for transferring the IP, this is something that Mintable offers that other platforms don't, which is where you can include in the data of the NFT that this is a transfer of copyright. And you know, obviously when you sell it, you're gonna to have to define the terms of this copyright, whether it's commercial use or you know, full rights or limited rights, whatever you wanna do, you would define that, but we put that into the metadata. So then someone can say, you know, um, I bought this item a year ago, maybe you're taking me to court today and I would just show you the transaction from a year ago and show you that the copyright was included in the blockchain. I have a proof of record, right? Showing in a public ledger that I bought something that came with the copyright and therefore you gave me the copyright. So now you're trying to sue me and you know that doesn't work. Uh, of course, this is a hard issue to solve because the copyright laws in Singapore are different than the ones in America, which are different than the ones in Europe, which are different than the ones in Africa. Right, and so it's a really big headache to deal with, um, but at a very general level, that's why we let you define it as a seller. Um, but at a general level, we put it on the blockchain so that people can do that. So you can facilitate a transfer of IP with it. You're not just buying the underlying blockchain asset. You could very well be buying the rights to a real asset. And when you get into an item like a physical item, then you could be buying a physical item. We've had people that have sold houses on Mintable where they made an NFT for their house. And obviously they accepted crypto and that was the deed to their house. Uh, of course, with that, you still have to have kind of a middleman to facilitate this. The government has to be involved to transfer ownership rights from the house from one person to the other. Uh, but these things, now when you're buying the NFT, you don't necessarily really care about what the content is. Maybe the content is just text. Maybe the content is just a copy of the certificate. Right. In the case of a 100 year old painting that we saw, uh, we sold from a, uh, an avant garde Russian painter who was born in like the 1800s. He's got pieces in the museum all around the world. Uh, we sold this painting, and the NFT itself was just a high resolution photo of the painting. Not very valuable because, you know, it's in, you know, it's in, uh, it, it's very old. So it's in public domain and anyone can use it. But what came on the private file of the NFT? was the certificate of authenticity and the certificate of ownership. And the only person that can access that is the person who owns the NFT, which is only one person, right? And so then you don't really care about the image that everyone sees on the NFT that you show off on your wallet, right? You don't, no one cares about this image. They care about what's on the NFT that's private. And then what comes with the NFT, because when you bought that, we actually mailed from London, the, the buyer was in Singapore, uh, from, from London to Singapore, we mailed uh, you know, like a hundred year old museum quality painting uh, to the buyer and they got the NFT, then they got the painting. And now, you know, they have the painting and the NFT side by side, right? And that's really powerful. And so at that point, you know, it depends on what you're selling and what the NFT actually makes up, because as I said, it's very versatile. So it could be anything and some things it won't apply to, some things it's really important to, and some things it's kind of in the middle. Thanks, Zach. I think that's a very powerful kind of um, conclusion, even for for this whole, whole entire webinar. Uh, you know, with 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 the potentials and upsides, really, of of, of what everything can bring about. Right. I mean, the, the whole decentralized um, finances and, and, and NFTs. Everything is just coming together and kind of like lifting barriers. Um, it's it's a wonderful note to end because at this point, timers are buzzing, directors queuing. I'm afraid we do have to come to an end to this Q&A session. And on that note, our webinar for today, I know there are many, many more questions coming in from the audience, but friends in the audience, audience, if you enjoyed the session, if you have any more questions, you know, um, keep in touch. Um, I think there's going to be QR codes and links uh, that's going to be shared at the end of the session. But if you enjoyed the session, uh, you know, give a big shout out to the organizers, show their support um, at the Singapore Fe FinTech Festival, um, fill up this satisfaction poll. Um, I think they're going to whip it up and at some point um, towards the end of the session, there is a satisfaction poll that you can fill up um, to show your support to Singapore FinTech Festival. Um, at this point, I also want to give you a big shout out to the team, Yvonne, Mia, Nazura for just being super awesome and helping us out behind the scenes. Guys, this is all for this edition for, of cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, DeFi, and NFTs supported by Singapore FinTech Festival.
My name is Francesca Tay, along with my all-star team at Bybit and special guest Zach Burks, founder and CEO of Mintable. Thank you guys for joining us today. Keep in touch. Follow us on Twitter, Telegram, LinkedIn. Uh, we'll see you again, I guess, next time if we have the pleasure. Thanks, guys. Thank you.